Good evening, church. Tonight we're continuing our two-part series on who's going to heaven. It came out of the question of, uh, do people in the Church of Christ, well, are they the only ones going to heaven? Uh, that's a question that came out to it, and we're going to try to answer that tonight in a couple of different ways. I'm setting my clock. Uh, in the midst of that, we want to focus, as we did last week, about what you know, what we can no, and to be sure, in the Bible, there's some things that God wanted us to know, and that's really where we spent most of last week. Things that we needed to start in the big picture, and then we would get more specific. Last week, we did hit on the fact we know that God wants us to be with him. That's important. We know that God wants us to be with him, and he put into place a plan so that we could be. He wants that, but he allows us to have the choice. We know that God has made salvation possible through Jesus. We talked about that last week. We know that. And we also know that it's only Jesus that we may come to the Father. Now that's a big statement to make. Only through Jesus may we come to the Father. It's going to get repeated several times throughout scriptures. We also know, because the Bible tells us, that not everyone is going to make it to heaven. But we know that there is a choice involved. I think it's very important to understand those things in our big scope of who's going to heaven. And also to stay in the world of things that we definitely know. This topic's no joke. It has to do with their eternal destiny, either eternal life or eternal destruction. And there's a lot of directions and concerns and emotions that this hints around because we have family members and friends we're really concerned about their salvation. Even ourselves sitting here or watching tonight, you may be wondering, how do I know I can go to heaven? A principal verse last week was in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, and we'll read that real quick just to kind of get our minds right into the, uh, the places that we need to. And in, in case that you weren't here last week or watching last week, this is a good thing to remind ourselves. In the end of his letter, 1 John, John is trying to get them to understand things that they know. And he hits on that phrase a lot. The, by this we know. And I mentioned that this morning. We'll look at that here in just a little bit. But in verse 13 of chapter 5, he says, I write these things that to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. What an amazing thing. To be able to say, you can know. So as we come to this question, let's stick with some things that we know. Matthew chapter 25, there's three parables in it. And it's one thing that Jesus is trying to make very clear in these parables. There's a distinction about those who will have eternal life and those who will have eternal destruction. If you remember, towards the end of that chapter, he's talking about the separation between the sheep and the goats. And Lydia Host was discussing that with me uh, this morning and did a wonderful job of explaining that. But in that passage, he's trying to make it very clear that there is going to come a judgment day. It's going to happen. This is a definite thing that we can know. When it happens, we do not know. But it will happen. And when it does happen, there will be a separation. There will be some who will inherit eternal life and some destruction. Verse 46 says that. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There is a distinction to be made there. Now, we don't have time right now to read the entire thing, but I really, really would encourage you to read all of Matthew 25. The other two parables and reinforce that idea that there is a distinction to be made. And beginning in verse 14 and going through verse 30, there's the parable of the talents in which there are two people who, based on what God has given them, opportunity that God has given them, abilities and resources God has given them, are blessed. They're blessed because they respond in a direction to honor and to please Him. But there's a third who lives out of fear. He does nothing, and he is not blessed. He's cast aside. In verse 30, it says, and cast the worthless servant into outer darkness in that place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But those who were faithful, well, he received the blessing of the master's joy. And that's amazing. In the beginning of the chapter, verses 1 through 11, we get the parable of the ten virgins. It's another 
uh, understanding of choice and separation that's going to come where Jesus is really wanting us to know. It's very important. He's spending a whole chapter on the topic. But there was those who made use of their time and those who squandered it. It's a pretty serious topic. There's no anywhere, anywhere in between. And when the time came, when the bridegroom came back at the end of that parable, the door was shut. And those who had not prepared, well, the Lord said to them, when they called out, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Be prepared. Who's going to heaven? Who's going to heaven? Now, with that understanding through chapter 25, the thrust of the New Testament is the fact that you can know that you are going to heaven. And that Jesus came, that you could have life and have it abundantly. And Jesus came to save his people from their sins. And that is the important message, the good news that we have about Jesus. But stick with what we know. John, 1 John, and as I said in chapters 3, uh, 4, and 5, he keeps hitting on that thing that you know. What you can know about your life. He says this in chapter 3 and verse 16. By this we know that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And he says in verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. He's talking about maintaining our life in Jesus. Verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments and abides in God and God in him, by this we know that he abides in us and by the spirit whom he has given us. Chapter 4, verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Do you hear the certainty in what he's talking about? The John that we talked about this morning is the one who wrote this and this letter is probably much later in his life. They estimate somewhere between 85 to 90, maybe just a little bit later. A.D. is when he wrote this. But this is a seasoned man, experienced in his faith, who has a very deep love for people. And he's wanting them to know, to be certain, that when they made the choice to be in Christ, they could know that they have eternal life. Now, if you go through the Gospels, and many of us would know the plan of salvation, and maybe you'll have time to discuss this in your discussion groups or what that in, involves, but at the very least, it's faith. You must have faith, for without faith, it is impossible to please him, referring to God, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Faith is so critical to know, believe, to trust, and obey God. But in, top, in, in building on top of your faith of what you come to understand about God, uh, you, you believe his promises and his, uh, the truths that he gives, you trust it, which means you make the decisions to shape your life around it, and then you simply follow him. Eventually, that's going to lead to repentance. Repentance from sins, and that's really the problem, sin that holds us back from heaven. But sin is our choice to disobey God, whether it's the things he tells us not to do and we choose to do them, or it's the things that he tells us to do, and we choose not to do them. It's either a transgression or it's an omission from what we do. Sin is the problem. But we know that God sent a solution in Jesus. And Jesus died for our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins. And so he offers us the gift of eternal life. And when we choose to follow him and to commit to him, when we see that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and we not just acknowledge that by mere word, but in our actions as well, and our devotion to him. And importantly, when we are baptized into him, our sins are washed away. We're a new creature. We are in Christ. And we receive the blessings that are found in Christ and only in Christ. The forgiveness of sin salvation, to be part of the kingdom of God. These are things that you can know that you have. And God has an expectation, an offering, that we can, we can take that and we can choose to participate in that. And we have the peace and the comfort of knowing that that is our life to be found in Jesus. And we can maintain that. And we know we can do that because he's explained how to do it. 
On the flip side, God also tells us how we know how to keep ourselves out of heaven. We can know that as well. If you look at passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, you'll see a list of sinful behaviors. But it's not just the sinful behaviors in, in themselves that we want to consider, but what it says about them. And if we spend our time devoted in them, do you not know, we'll begin in verse eight or 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? There's certainty in that as well. You can know that if you participate in this, and this is your choice, and this is your life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can know that. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Sometimes people stop right there, and it sounds very doom, doom, doom. I get it, but I like the next verse quite a bit as well. Sure, you will not, and you can know you will not inherit the kingdom of God if you stop there. True, but that next verse is so beautiful. And such were some of you. They came out of it. They chose not to make that them, their lives, and they chose to be in Christ. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. A choice was made. Now, that's the same choice they made back in Acts chapter 2, isn't it? When Peter gave that great sermon and people responded to it and they kind of realized where they were in relationship to, with God and it was a bad place. I mean, they had the history they were Jewish people and they'd come to celebrate a very, very important Jewish holiday and then perhaps very faithful in that. But Jesus had died, and he'd paid the price for our sins, and that old covenant had passed, and we're now under the new one. And in the realization of where they were because of their sins, they asked that incredible question, men and brethren, what shall we do? I bet there was a lot of pain in that asking of that question. A lot of hurt to recognize how far you are from God, and in turn far from heaven. Because that's the crux of all of this, our relationship with God. It's not just the ethics and the morals and the rules and the boundaries. It's that relationship with God that's critical. Those are important, don't get me wrong. Please don't misunderstand. If God gives a command, it's important. But all of that serves a relationship with God, especially with, with Jesus. And if we understand him as the deity, as the Christ, the Savior, which they're coming to that understanding... And we recognize that the sin separates us, but he's, he's wanting to save us from it. It's the same question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter gave the answer to where you can know. He said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, 3,000 obey at that particular time and do that. And their lives are transformed, and they come together, and they're looking at a new way of life on earth, and they're anticipating a lot of changes. But to be with God because of that relationship with Jesus is critical. Verse 47 of that chapter says, And the Lord added to the church, his church, daily those who were being saved. That is the church, people who belong to Jesus, the church of Christ. That's a distinction that's really critical to make at this point. What do we even mean by Church of Christ? I don't mean it in a denominational term. And I hope none of us mean it in that way. In the same way that you may look at any religious group and say, well, they call themselves this, or they call themselves whatever, and I'm not going to go through naming different groups. It doesn't serve our purpose. What we can know is that the people who belong to Jesus, the people, Jesus, as uh, people, the church, that is a descriptor of those who are going to heaven. Now, we say, well, is that only the people who go to buildings that have the sign out front? No, impossible. They didn't have that in the first century. In fact, if you look at most of the places they met, it was not church buildings. That didn't come as a regular thing until probably the third or the fourth century. We do have archaeological evidences of house churches 
uh, in the mid third century, and you can go visit those sites. Fascinating. Sometimes they would meet at the temple, sometimes they would meet out in a field, and there was probably not such a thing as a church sign as the way that we do it. But we use them, don't we? They're good markers. You would hope that if you see a certain marker, it would be the indicator of the people who are obedient to Jesus. That I'm interested in. But more importantly than the name out front is what do the people do inside or throughout the week? Do they hold Jesus as their head and their Savior? That's a good place to start. And if they do, do they view him as deity? If not, there's a problem. Not the right marker. Not the right marker at all. He's clearly deity and he's clearly Savior. And think about that. That makes all the difference in terms of the relationship. If they have that at the beginning of it, that's a good marker. And do they seek to live in a way that glorifies him and upholds him and keeps him at the forefront of uh, their lives? If so, that's a very, very good marker. Do they follow his commands? Do they love him? It's an excellent marker. Are they looking for ways to bring people together and to edify and to build up? It's what Jesus did. It's a good marker. Do they teach salvation is through Christ and Christ alone and only in the way that he gives it? It's a very, very good marker. And do they have the same ambitions and values of Jesus? Do they worship in the way that he would command for us to worship in the Bible? These are very good markers. What you see people doing on a day-to-day basis in the way that they gather and they worship and they live and they uphold Jesus, this determines who the church of Christ is. Not as a name, but as a descriptor of the people who belong to Jesus. Sometimes it is on the front of the building. And we get that name from scriptures, of course, Romans 16, 16 and other places. And there's other names that the church was called in the New Testament as well, and those are all fine. Those are all fine as well. But what they do and how they live and how they devote themselves in the relationship to Jesus, that determines everything. That is the most important thing. And to be clear on the flip side, there's some places you'll go and it will say Church of Christ on the outside, but he may be very absent on the inside. If they don't uphold him in the way that they should as deity and as savior and they don't live according to his commandments, and they spend more time tearing down than they do building up. And they spend more time talking about their ambitions more than his. And they find ways to push away people rather than draw them to the gospel. And they look nothing like the first century church or the ones that strove hard to glorify Jesus after. In that sense, the churches of Christ, the people who belong to Jesus, the people who belong to Jesus Those that he saved and he sanctified, those that live after him, those will go to heaven. Outside of Jesus, we know, we know the Bible says there is no salvation outside of Jesus for the normal lives of people that are conscious and capable of thinking and responding. And that's an important distinction. It boils down to what we know. Now, I've spent 18 minutes on that and two seconds. There's a lot more nuance to that for sure. That's why we're going to get to that in the discussion groups. And you're saying, well, he didn't cover this. That's for your discussion groups. And I hope you do discover, uh, discuss it quite a bit. If you remember last week, I said prepare, bring it for this week. We want to make use of this time. But I want you to focus on what we know. The things that we cannot know, and there's some questions that are very difficult that maybe we don't have a sure answer. Don't get too bent out of shape over. Stick with what you know. It makes all the difference in the world, all the difference in the world. We'll close with an invitation. Tonight, you might know that you are not in Christ because you haven't obeyed the gospel. You might know that you need repentance because you have sin in your life. and You've never done anything to take care of it, to allow Jesus to take care of it. Tonight, you may be a Christian you may be one of his people, but it may be that you've, you've fallen away and you've, you've put church far from where you should be. it should be in your life, and Jesus is no longer your master. He was, but you gave it over to somebody else, something else in the world. And it's corrupted you, and it's hurt you, and it's separated you and damaged your relationship with Jesus. Listen, that is the most important relationship you have. Do not treat it lightly. And when you have moments like this right now, where the whole point is to stop and consider who you are because of Jesus, 
who you need to be because of Jesus and how you can be in Jesus, make use of the moment that you have. I say it a lot, but it's true. Your soul is so, so precious. It is to God. So much so that Jesus was willing to come down here and teach and live and die to pay for your sins. It's that precious. And the way that we live every single day to honor him is that important. Please do not treat it lightly. And if you're saying, yeah, I don't know if I can do it alone, then don't do it alone. We'll be there with you. And understand with God, you are not alone. There's no greater encouragement than that. God wants you to be with him. And if you think, if you think, I, but not me, please change that thinking. He absolutely wants and loves you. And we love and care about you at this church. If there's a way we can serve you and be there for you, please let us know. You absolutely matter. You are absolutely loved. Don't ever forget that. But if there's a way we can help you, let us know as we stand and as we sing.